look at me. Boy, do I look good. Jeez, <laughs> you look comfy. <laughs> Thank you. A joy to see everybody. <laughs> so nice. Lucien, how do you pronounce your name? Uh, Lucien. Lucien. Yeah. Okay, that's my daughter's name. No you're, way! You're the only other person I've ever met with that name. How cool. Wow. I was amazing. just going to tell you the same thing. I've never met anybody with that name. Everybody always pronounces it incorrectly. Yeah, yeah. We almost thought we made it up, but I guess not. Right. I did. Whoa, the room's filling up. Right, we're just going to give it a couple more minutes before we start the toast because it's just 5.01, so we want to give everyone time to get in. Always CP time, always. Here comes everybody. Hi, Nina. Now put mute, so because if you say whatever. How many chairs is that behind you there, Javisa? What do you say? How many chairs are, are, are there behind you there? Forty. <laughs> we, we need like twenty four people. Oh. We're good to go, man. That's right. I was telling Tracy, I can't even count how many hours of my life I spent putting those chairs up and taking them down over the years. <laughs> yeah. I can this imagine. Is, this is Tribe's gallery space set up for a poetry reading in the background. Hey, do you, remember, do you remember that David Hammond's piece that Steve had? It was like a wire, and then he had these little Afro puffs. What was the name of that piece? I just remember? The Wall. That, the Wall? Was that it? That, that I knew of. Everyone just called it The Wall. Steve sold it twice. <laughs> and David Hammond still has it now somehow. <laughs> sold it two different times and they still don't own it. Those people. <laughs> so people paid for it? Are you serious? <coughs> a it's lot so of steep. money. I mean, it funded tribes for a year every time he sold it, you know? <laughs> it's so Steve esque. <laughs> Video of us taking it down. Taking then he off. took it down when he left, yeah. <laughs> Sold it twice. Wow. Well, people paid to like reproduce it and they considered it having bought it, but then he sold it again and then one person took the wire from the hair. But then he's like, I'm keeping the wall. And now David's going to the wall. <laughs> wow. That is so Steve esque. It, it really is. And he could get away with that. That's the crazy thing. No one else could get away with selling something twice and keeping it, except him. <laughs> oh man! Oh, I, didn't know that. That. I didn't know the bike wire. The wires were bike rims. I didn't. Know. I thought they were like hangers or some shit. You're right. There was. They were. Yeah. It was wires and human hair at the top. That's right. So it looked like barbed wire on top of a wall, kind of. Yeah. Whatever happened to the piece that was uh, in the tree outside tribes for years? Mm. Hammond's oh. tree. I don't know. Is it still there? Because that was okay. one of the local so, so it was it's taken down. It was taken down by, um, I believe it was taken down by like the, uh, either the police or the, um, or like, or uh, like a property manager who owned the tree, like, or the city. But what I remember was that like, uh, people were make, calling and making complaints that like the women who lived in the shelter across the street were sitting on the chairs because there were chairs. There were like mm -hmm. little seats like set up around it, um, uh, and and like people who lived in the neighborhood like would call and complain that like these women were, you know, being too loud or whatever. Um, so, so then I don't know if it was the city, I think it was the city like came and took it apart or mm. actually maybe like, I think you Steve might have told me that like that the city made a complaint and so David Hammond's had to take it down or something like oh. that. I can't remember if, it was the city or if it was David Hammonds that took it down, but 
yeah like it was because because people make complaints about this about uh, like women who are sick <clears throat> smoking cigarettes I, and, i'm know, not going to name names stuff. but there were people who were discussing uh stealing that tree for years uh, <laughs> I guess they probably should have, but you know, they, the city just took it away. But well, well, you know, David built it for those women because they were across the street, like you know, um, like smoking cigarettes and stuff and talking, and so he built it actually, like, so that they would have a place to sit down and like and hang out and you know. Whatever. It was it, but was it there? That was there in like the nineties, even. Right. Very cool. I, we now have. A, I was there in 97, 97 <laughs> to like I don't know, thousand one or whatever. I don't know. And also, some of you might be seeing some chats over here. Feel free to use the chat feature. You can also like talk amongst yourselves <laughs> if you want to as well, so you can continue the conversation over there. Um, we're going to start the reading. We have a full room. We've got like at least two, <laughs> two slides of everyone. So you can even scroll to the right and left to see who else is here. Those of you who aren't familiar with Zoom. Um, we wanted to kick off the reading with a toast to Steve Cannon because this is the first reading we've done other than the memorials um, that he's gone. So I'm going to hand this over to our board member, Katie Duncan, and she's going to open the toast with a poem to Steve Cannon. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm not doing much of an introduction, but I hope that you all might uh, recognize something familiar in what I'm going to read, which is for Steve. The quiet, the silence, the fortitude, the lights on, the watch off, the step balance, sure foot down, see where you're going, the everything thrown off that you knew before is on. Who wrote about you? Better who knew what these moments were to you and translated to how your internal vision, world view, soar, become, succumb, succeed, as in success. How would your life then unknown overcome, let the other succumb and still succeed to be the cornerstone, launch pad, jive who's what's he wanna be, what internal jazz, fire pit blazed a light, make it all all right without the sight you used to see. Step light, be here, be gone. Now door open. It was always the old door, same old door. Top of the stairs, knock once, maybe twice. Maybe you learned who was knocking, waited for the door to open, never too preoccupied with what was on the other side. Like when you pick up the phone, keep right on talking to introduce the room. Let them know what was already going on. Like at the end of the bar where we met, nightly the door and you called out to them to let them know who was there, seeing with your ears, yelling it out into the night, onto the stage, here be gone, breaking all that shit down. Read the damn poem, introduce yourself. One side of the door is not so different and not just the same. You knew every name. I never asked you about the virgin in the hollow on the way up, in the stairwell down. You were at the top, you were at the bottom. On the couch waiting, or in the newspaper on the wall, on your bathroom wall, a picture of a bathroom stall to feed a fucking tiptoe stand up, shuffle to be safe where you can't see. I always wanted you to see me. We all did, did. The path, the stairs, the door, the stairs, the garden, a chorus of poets, and your litany of people. Make me a CD of your favorite songs. Tell me what, show me what you'd want me to see. Here, here we are, Steve, Calvin, Professor, your litany, our liturgy. Wow. Here's to you, Steve. Thank you so much, Katie. That was awesome. All right, we're going to raise our glasses two more times for a total of three to Steve. Um, I'm going to read two really short pieces by Steve Cannon himself. This is called Wiggle Room. Mm. Did you know, don't you know, this thing we call Earth wobbles as it revolves around the sun and rotates on its axis. I wonder if it hums. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> 
We love you madly, Steve. Steve. Yes, Steve. You can make noise. You're unmuted. Hey. Uh -huh. <laughs> we can make noise. On right, last one. This is his famous poem that he always read. So I'm just trying to call him in to be here with us. No mean, no mean matter. What does it matter when nothing matters? When everything is in tatters, scattered, scattered. and disappears or vanishes like particles into the dark. Okay. Steve Cannon. Steve Cannon, hooray. We love you. I love you, Steve. Love awesome. You. And there's nothing you can do about it. Thing you can do about it. So thank you all so much for being here and for taking time during this quarantine when you could be binge watching Netflix or whatever we're doing <laughs> um, to sit and listen to some poetry and to sit and listen to some tribes authors share some work. Some of them might also be sharing prose, but to just take time out for people's creative work and literature. Um, the first person we're going to hear from is Willie Perdomo, who has um, I think I first met at Tribes in like 2003, but I'm sure he was around long, long, long before that. Um, Willie Perdomo is the author of The Crazy Bunch, which was the winner of the... Oh. <laughs> hey. Okay. Hold on, I'm getting it. <laughs> are, you, are you doing this wrong? Yeah. <laughs> it's Lydia Cortez calling my phone. <laughs> All right, go to Zoom. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't be tribes if that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> she just popped it up on my phone. I don't even know how she did that. Um, <laughs> happy tribes. All right, Willie Perdomo is the author of The Crazy Bunch. It won the 2019 and 2020 New York City Book Award. Um, the Essential Hits of Shorty Bonbon bon was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Smoking Lovely won the Penn Open Book Award. And we're a nickel cost a dime, a finalist for the Poetry Society of North America, Norma Farber Book Award. He's also a co-editor of the Breakfast Poetry Series anthology Latinx. He wor his work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Best American Poetry 2019, African Voices, and much more. He's currently a Lucas Artist Literary Fellow and teaches at Phillips Exeter Academy. Everybody, welcome Willie Perdomo. Hello. Man, I miss Steve. I really miss Steve. I miss coming to New York City. You know, I live in New Hampshire now. Just coming yeah. to New York, dropping in on him uh, spontaneously. And he, oh, the first thing he would have said, he was like, man, I haven't seen you in a zillion trillion years, or something like that. You know, he, he had a great sense of uh, hyperbole, Steve. And, uh, I miss him dearly, but I also miss John Ferris. And John Ferris used to come through as well. And those two, I would just kind of sit in front of and just kind of soak up science, as much science as I could. So salute to both of them. And uh, I'm just gonna read some uh, two pieces here. This one is from the, both of them are gonna be from the crazy, will be from the crazy bunch. Each one teach one. And what dribbled out when the block coughed at the end of the night? A Superman action figure, purple five food stamps, golden glove wannabes, Mighty Mouse cheese lines, a Dapper Dan Gucci watch, a ticket to the celebrity club, a bevy of Yamahas, a dope MC at the rooftop, a Wuha trope and a skate key stopper, claws can't get formed, Mickey's, Mikey's pigeon coop, Abuelita's chicken soup, the parade float, the honey on the float, the honey right off the boat, straight sentences, no please, a rat cheesing in the garbage, a sunset surfing the Harlem line, tenant patrol flies, a silent accomplice, a firefly in the jar, a pair of faded jeans, a portrait in lattice, co-opted cypress, an old life magazine, a preacher's splinted head, two rusty badges, a cluster of pill bottles, a combination lock, a corroded by greeting card, invested with gears, a primal scream, a gangster's last wish, unpaid bills in a beat box, like each one, teach one, Ethiop used to say, those ain't bodies washing up on the street, those are receipts. Forget what you saw. I never got to read this book in front of Steve. I would have read this poem right in front of Steve. Forget what you saw. You want to see 
you're in the whip looking, you want to be seen as you seen. You want to be seen and haven't been seen, never seen again. There's hurt in your eye. It's been there since the Dutch set up shop. You ain't running from nothing, but you ain't chasing nothing either. Looking as in the best way to watch was the other way, to see before they could say, I saw. You lean to the side and recline, only to see who else is hurting. This is how you decide to gaze these days. Who? This? That and the third, always looking for something. Light most definitely. Black, bite the sky off it, man. Bring some, they said. You talking so much. The shook ones always live and running starts. What block was that again? Who was that you said again? Who you again? Those tails lie best on nights like these who try to at least fly and shoot. Please. Yours go bling black. Blacker, blacker, brain split and spilling. Spilling and spilling bomb for that last for walk-in and last testament hunger all teeth no show time to eat apart from money what did we spend the starting line ends here in the land of ballers and shot callers the land of cuban links and choco funk sink as far bottom as you can you can decide but why always why always always why always everything everything got to be about love just wondering god it's true you could be a lot of things giving everything that's out there forget what you saw People who know this for sure are very suspicious of this nothing. Blood is always looking for a subject. A little something about the beginning before it starts. The attempts to find yourself at off-peak hours. No images would be perfect for this chill in the cut. Swear to God and kaboom. Bodies fall faster than stock prices. Seem more than the time it takes to forget. The thing is, though, not to stay behind from you. Peace, y'all. Beautiful, Willie. Thank you. Oh, this silent clapping. What a strange new world we're in. Yay. Thank you so much, Willie. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I just want to remind you to stick around because afterward we're going to open it up to a Q&A with the authors. Um, and the audience can, you can actually talk back and we can hear you, that'll be nice. Next up, we have Catherine Arnaldi. Um, Catherine Arnaldi, PhD, is the author of the graphic novel, The Amazing True Story of a teen Teenage Single Mom. And uh, when I first moved to Tribe, Steve immediately made me read that book and I absolutely, he was like, I think you'll love this. And he was right, I loved it. And then I became a big fan. Um, I was a kid and I was a huge fan. Um, this was named Top 10 Book of the Year by Entertainment Weekly. Also the author of the story collection, All Things Are Labor, out from University of Massachusetts Press in 2007, which won a Juniper Award. She's also the recipient of two New York Foundation for the Arts Award, the Hinfield Transatlantic and Du Jour Awards, and a, a Fulbright to Paraguay. She met Steve Cannon on her first day in New York City in January of 1987. The next day, they went to see Billy Bang, then to Bullet Space, and so on, until sitting together, holding hands, a few days before he left the planet. Everyone, give a round of silent applause to Catherine Arnaldi. Sorry. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> uh -oh. Catherine. <laughs> Audio problem. Hold on. Someone has to unmute Catherine, or does she need to unmute herself, Tracy? She probably needs to unmute herself. Yeah, Catherine, sorry. Tracy is like, she had everybody muted, but you need to unmute yourself. I don't think she can do that. Okay, is that good? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Okay. All right, sorry about that. So, um, so Rita Naranjo, then she came up to get a book signed and I signed her book and I said, well, what is it? What are you going to do? And she said, I'm going to be a teenage mom activist just like you. And she has been to, uh, before she was age 20, she was to Washington, D.C. twice uh, to talk to Congress. She's the head of uh, Teen Mom uh, 
um, work, she, she works with, uh, she's now teaching in college. All right, this is called Welfare from All Things Are Labor. Mm -hmm. There is nothing but what is here. What is here is the thin bone child left for dead, but she is not dead. She is something, my thin bone child, my child. She is alive with cracked lips, crusty eyes. Inside her mouth is a dark color. There is something wrong with her tongue. I cannot look. We have been forced here, backed up to here, then left. I cannot take my eyes off my thin bone child, even if I wanted to, which I never, ever want to do. Look, you can see her now. There she is by the side of the road, waiting for anything moving, anything that is out of place. If something squeals, is run over, dragged, she is on it, holding it up high, bringing it back, trying to keep it from biting, trying to keep it from coming completely apart. Me, I have not caught one whole animal, not even a lizard, a bug. Everything I find is already picked apart, already dead. What I want is to find something for the thin bone child, something. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can people hear Catherine? No. All right, Tracy, can you unmute Catherine? All right, now oh. I'm unmuted. Okay, <laughs> okay. I, I don't think I was supposed to use, so should I, I guess I start again? I don't know. I think the last um, thing I heard was thin bone child. If you want to um, start again, you can. I'm sorry about all the glitches. This is our first time running a Zoom. <laughs> okay. All right. Feel free uh, to I don't start know. over so we can take it in. All right. It's uh, welfare, um, and it's, uh, it's called welfare from all things are labor. There is nothing but what is here. Thin bone child left her dead, but she is not dead. She is something. My thin bone child. My child. She is alive with cracked lips, crusty eyes inside her. Her mouth is a dark color. There's something wrong with her tongue. I cannot look. We have been forced here, backed up to here, then left. I cannot take my eyes off my thin bone child, even if I wanted to, which I never, ever, ever want to do. Look, you can see her now. There she is by the side of the road, waiting for anything moving, anything that is out of place. If something squeals, Hi, bringing it back, trying to keep it from biting, trying to keep it from coming completely apart. Me, I have not caught one whole animal, not even a lizard, a bug. Everything I find is already picked apart, already dead. What I want is to find something for the thin bone child, something to bring to the thin bone child, something to make it better, something for her that she needs. But by the time I get there, it is just intestines with fur on it, a head with maggots, a few bones already cleaned white or just the empty highway. I am the one that is supposed to get the animals, supposed to provide, but I have not caught one. I look for a bag, a can, a bag with the taste of salt still on it. I dig for water like this. I did not teach the thin bone child to It is not just the tongue. She sucks on a flattened horde toad, holds it in her. She takes the stingers out of scorpions, puts them in her mouth, lets them whip. She knocks a lizard on a rock, clamps it on her ear. She collects thorns. I cannot take my eyes off the thin bone child. I love the thin bone child. You would too if you saw her moving there between the sawara, hiding behind organ pipe, a sagebrush, her hair matted and wild. What she does with the animals, she keeps them alive. She has a stick to keep the animals from dragging themselves away. She doesn't let the buzzard get anywhere close. She feeds them flies and prickly pears. Then she breaks off a part of the animal and puts it right in her mouth with the horned toad. 
It could be the foot of a rabbit, the tiny leg and tail of a mouse, or a wing with feathers. That thin bone child is something to see. There is more here than you would think. I have my claw, my beak, my shredded tire. At night there are howls, the snorts of javelinas, hoots and wills. Once a deep buzz of bees went by and made it dark night at day. I dig a hole for the worst of the heat. I put stones in my skirt for cool. At night they are warm. There is no one looking for us, no one looking out for us. We're left. The cars with the thick boned people go by. They go back and forth and forth and back. They seem to look, but they see nothing. Their windows are rolled up or blacked out, their air conditions on. What we are looking for is something small that we can use. That's all we need, a little bit. Something that happened by chance. Something common, like a broken piece of glass. Some string, a book of matches. Just a small thing where there is nothing but what is here to find. There were boys that went through here on horses then went south. There are the cars, like I said, bags and canteens, buckles and flaps. They said there was nothing from here to where they started out from but empty this and empty that. They said they had seen nothing of thin bone girls and their thin bone child. They had seen enough of them. They were sorry, but they could not stop. They could not talk. Then they came back and gave the thin bone child a knife. It is a thin bone child that always gets something. She makes noises. When those boys gave her that knife, she ran after them, jumped up, grabbed onto a cuff, held on, made her gurgles, her deep nargles, her harguts, her grunts, her groove. They kicked her off. You ought to teach that thing to talk, they said, just in case. I should, I should teach. Whoever taught me to talk was all wrong. Not one word turned out. For me, there is more than what is here, things I do not want to teach the thin bone child. A red-headed buzzard sits there on her pole waiting for something cast off. Coyotes close in at night. Every day, the thin bone child goes further and further and further out. Each day, she brings back more. She has a big-eared rabbit, blue hummingbird morsels, the head of a wolf, even, I swear, a goat. She can use a bottle cap a cigarette filter, an old snake skin, a piece of barbed wire. Thin bone child knows how to act. For the thin bone child, there is nothing but what is here and she is making something of it. Down from her lookout and off behind them. That black goo is part honey, that's what I think. She's making something of every little thing. One of the cars with the thick bone people skidded off the road and rolled over and over and over, then stopped. People and bringing them back, squealing and not all of one piece. There were parts not appendage, dangling, snakes of insides dropping, drippings. She is keeping them alive with the rest of her animals, using yucca to wrap the places that are falling out, using the aloe vera plant to stuff the branches of a phaedra. At night, she makes her soft noises, coos at them, brushes back their hair, offers the stingerless scorpion, the buzzard foot. At first, he did not move. Now they sit up by her fire, make noises back, clap when she makes those thin bone child faces. They even sing. I don't know if she is breaking off pieces of them, if that was a finger I saw in her mouth with the horn toad and the honey. I am afraid to look. She does not say a word about it. I already told you she doesn't talk. One day she took down the blue plastic roof and put the thick boned people on it along with her things. She put my claw, my beak, my shredded tire on top and started off. What she came to was the rolled over car. The thin bone child pulled on this, pushed in that. She put the thick boned people in the back, her things in the trunk. She got in, started it up and drove it right back on the road. One thing I know, it is wrong to teach a poor child no. It is wrong to teach a poor child can't or don't. We are on the road now. 
me and the thin boned child and the thick boned people, I think we're taking them home. They look out from under their blue plastic blanket and smile. We were left for dead, but we are not dead. The thin boned child is turning the lights on. She's taking a horn toad out of her mouth, putting it on her knee, opening her plastic bottle full of goat blood or wolf blood or rat blood, make, taking a sip and passing it around. The thick boned people lean over the seat, they gurgle, they charl, they grunt. The thin boned child has it's taught us how to talk, they say. I make a gar gargle. They nod, touch me on the shoulder. What we are is gathered together. There is the deep down sound of the engine of things finally moving. What we have with us is the bat with spikes, the sharpened piece of muffler, the rabbit feet with their deep claws, the hubcap knife blades, a lighter that works. The thin bone child knows how to act. She is on the road with the windows rolled down, making those noises, spitting out that black goo, heading into the city with everything that she dragged off the road, took apart and put back together, and is now offering up. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Catherine, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Should be so, you're on mute. Oh, I'm muted again. Hello. <laughs> I was saying, yeah, thank you for sharing that haunting work, Catherine. You know I love haunting things. I really appreciate that. That was nice. That was right up my alley. All right, we have two more readers. Um, the next reader was actually, um, one of the most recent, if I'm not sure if she's the most recent, but one of the most recent authors published by Fly by Night Press. Lucian Berrios is the author of Thunder and Sunshine in One Body, which is a collection of poetry published by Fly by Night Press, which is a subsidiary of a gathering of the tribes in 2017. Her second book was released in 2018 titled Women of Eve's Garden. This was an anthology she curated consisting of 10 female and non-binary poets and one visual artist. Her work was also featured in Tribe's Word Anthology as well as Silver-Tongued Devils. She runs writing workshops in middle and high schools around New York City, promoting creative writing as a way to navigate difficult experiences outside of harmful coping mechanisms. And I know Steve Cannon was a big fan and promoter of Lucian. Everybody give it up for Lucian Berrios. Uh, hey, everyone. <laughs> Hi, okay, so... I have a couple of um, short poems if my computer will agree with me. I'm not the most um, technical person, I'll admit. Uh, okay, so this one, a lot of these are unpublished. There's a couple that I, I will read that are from uh, the books that I published with Steve. Um, and I just wanna thank everybody for even being here and thanks to Visa for even asking me to be here. I I'm a, a big fan you and your work, uh, so I can't believe I'm even doing this with with all of you right now. And um, it's just a testament to how much Steve like totally changed my life, and I'm just immensely and continuously grateful, like every single day. So I'm so happy to be here. Anyway, this one is um, unpublished. It's uh, called The Life in Trees. And I, I wrote it um, right after my mom passed away, uh, almost a year to the day uh, that Steve passed away also. Um, okay. Um, flame to skin, scorching under maddening sun and through crisp air. And as I turned my head on this fall day, the trees reminded me, everything dies. Red, gold, orange, a fire in trees. Everything burns brightly before fading. Everything goes down in flames. Every even as it dies. The image of the tree as family was no mistake. Each autumn leaves slowly turn all colors of amber and garnet, becoming most beautiful before, before falling away dancing on the descent. 
not all at once, but each at its own rate, at its own readiness, as the ones we love do. Not all at once, but each at their own destiny, and the roots stay, stay strong, giving way to new life, to children of leaves and their novice green, sprouting dreams and flowers, for they too shall be set ablaze by destiny's call. Skateboard scene, you, you pass through every... I'm sorry? I can't hear. Oh no. He's muted. I think I think so. <laughs> well that's interesting. Who was that? That's weird. Um okay, well I'm just I'm gonna continue anyway. Um let's see what we have here. I've got a few things. This one I wrote because it reminds me of Steve. Um just because you know, part of like you know, it wasn't just like coming to read to him and stuff like that. Like we really hung out, you know, he was like a, just a really good friend. And, you know, I don't know, we used to listen to jazz sometimes and exchange music. And uh, he got me into listening to jazz. I got him listening to a little bit of Amy Winehouse, who I thought he might like appreciate her older stuff. But anyway, um, I wrote this kind of like with him, with him in mind. Um, it's called Vibrations. Vibrations, as the piano keys are tapped, loved spontaneously, calculating breath, as the bongo is hit palm or fingers, vibrations. Travel to me and through me as though fingers caressing my neck. Through trills and saxophone jumping in to be heard, the cello humming, humming. Warmth in my skin, heart swelling, the comfort and pleasure of a kiss on the collarbone. Vibrations, the syncopation, improvisation, in music, in life, it's jazz. Okay, thank you. Now, um, let's see, thanks guys. <laughs> I'm gonna read this one because I am a hopeless romantic as as Steve knew because I told him all my love troubles and he gave me the best and funniest advice ever. He thought I was way too nice. But uh, <laughs> this one is called um, Cup Runneth Over. Let your cup runneth over, over me. And with the crashing of waves, my heart to yours. With the song of wind, my breath against your lips. It is life my life in yours. As petals bloom, awakening to life, so my body to yours. Dreams so real, life seems to be dreams. Let your cup runneth over, over me. Tossing and turning a pile of limbs, vines around trees, you and me. As the fruit that swings on summer trees, I hang on your every word. Let your cup runneth over, over me, and I will drink of this love merciless word and be intoxicated by your fingertips on my spine. Let your cup runneth over, over me. This exaltation, this enrapture, as the air I breathe, you surround me, live within me, are part of everything I see, an au revoir among the magnificence of things. You appear with my eyes open. You emerge on the back of my eyelids, in the palm of my hands and my beads. Let your cup runneth over, over me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. There was one I wanted to read, but my my phone is not cooperating with me, which is just perfect for um, what what is happening uh, today. So, um, how much time do I have left? I'm so sorry to even ask that question. Um, I I think it's been about eight minutes. So you know, read 
read one more. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. Cool. All right. So here we go. Hold on. Um, let's see. I'm so sorry that this happened. Um, but my my phone has just completely died on me. You know what? We'll just read something else. No big deal. So, okay. This is just a little short one. I, you know, because during this whole, like, quarantine thing, you know, there's, like, not a whole lot to do, um, which is which is kind of good. Like, as a Pisces, I kind of like that, like, being left alone, like, getting to live the way I kind of <laughs> would normally want to. thoughts on it. This one is called Dogwood. Um, and I kind of wrote it, it, it. There was a tree outside the last place I had uh, that I was living. I went through a breakup and a move during this whole time too. So it's been like a lot of transition to so a lot of reasons to write also. Um, not only internally, but everything that's happening externally also. But um, what I do for a living, my day job, besides like doing this, is I work in property management. And you know, one of my tenants, unfortunately, well, fortunately, they're fine now, but a young man at 44 was um, put into ICU due to this whole um, situation and was on a respirator. And I had a conversation with the mother and it was just like really heartbreaking, um, you know, because I could hear it in her voice that she was like giving up. So I, I wrote this kind of like, uh, just a short prose thing kind of into in response to that, I was sitting outside really, really easily. It doesn't take a whole lot. And that's kind of how fragile like we are in a sense, but they still bloom regardless of that fact. So um, yeah, it's called dark dogwood. Did the flowering dogwood know before thrusting open its wide reaching pink and white fingers that they could come tumbling down at the careless dust of the wind? or the heavy pour of a rain? Had she foreseen, would she have kept her fist clenched? Or does she stretch fingertips to sky just to watch them glow in glory under the sun? No matter the wind, no care for the rain. Thank you. Nice. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, and this last one is another one I wrote. Just, you know, there's a lot of like self-healing and stuff happening. Um, it doesn't really have a title yet, but whatever. Um, it was a feeling I had long for all my tears and praying. It was untempered love. The universe gave me a taste of what had seemed such a distant memory. It was peace, warmth as the sun permits, growing within me for all my prayers. Does the sun too look to the gods, the universe before it shines? Or does he know what to do? Passionate stardust and fire, me, star eyes and soul ablaze. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And cheers to Steve, man. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> to Steve. Oh, I wish we could hear everyone clapping. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> That's so strange. <laughs> you can unmute yourselves to clap. <laughs> Thank you, Lucianne. Oh my gosh. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank you, everybody. Those are really lovely. Together and just being here with some tribes authors and with each other, I've, I've just been loving this. Um, there's one author left before we get to the Q&A, and this woman... I think it was maybe only the second time, maybe the first time I met her was actually at Steve's Memorial at the Bowery. And she read a piece that really blew me away. It was just so moving. Um, she really is, she ha she really just brings a lot of energy to the stage and she's, she's a wonderful writer. She's been inspiring me lately and been giving me um, just some support and some things that I'm doing in my life. And I'm so happy to have her here. Um, Gabrielle David is a multidisciplinary artist and the publisher of Two Leaf Press. Gabrielle became involved in the New York poetry scene during the 1990s and served as literature coordinator at the Langston Hughes Community Library and Cultural Center in Queens throughout most of the decade. 
Her work with the library prompted the creation of under the Intercultural Alliance of Artists and Scholars, a New York-based nonprofit organization, which she founded in 2000 and has served as the executive director since its inception. She was the editor of Branches of the Tree of Life, co-editor of Hey, Yo, Yo, Soy, 40 Years of New York and Street Poetry, 2012. She's the author of several chat books. Um, and everyone, please give a big round of applause to Gabrielle David. Here she comes. I'm gonna try to get her up here in front. And let's see, we're having a technical issue. Gabrielle needs to unmute herself, and then maybe Tracy, can you move her to the front of the screen? Mute my can you hear me now? I can hear you now, but it still says mute, and that happened last time to Catherine. I don't want it to happen to you where you suddenly get muted again. Tracy, do you know why it still says mute over Gabrielle, even though we can hear her? And is there a way to move her to the front? Maybe because I'm really not here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't show I'm that just, uh, she's muted on mine, so I don't know. Um, okay. But yeah. Is there a way to move her to the front where so right now it's Lucy on? Yeah. Oh, front of the stage. Yep. Hi, <laughs> Lucy. <Yeah>, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Cool. Funny. All right. Well, all I can say is is that uh, I'm I greatly appreciate uh, being asked to to participate in this. Um, I knew Steve back in the go-go 90s when, you know, poets traveled in herds and we went and did all kinds of things together as a group. Um, I don't know if that era will ever come back again. It was very open-minded. People were experimenting. People were doing great things. Danny Schott is here. He was, you know, a publisher of that era and published a lot, a lot of great poets. So, um, you know, um, my hat's off to Steve. Um, I, um, I'm glad I had a chance to speak to him before he passed away. It was about a month before. Um, but um, um, sometimes people come into your life, they're not in it 100%. You don't see them every day, speak to them every day. But when you meet certain people, they leave, um, they leave something behind inside of you. And I think that one of the great things about this organization that's still moving on is that he's left enough inside of all of us to try to help keep uh, gathering the tribes going. So I'm grateful for Chavisa and the board members and all of the uh, gathering the tribe writers who are working really hard to um, uh, keep uh, Steve Cannon's legacy going. Uh, I'm just gonna read and you all can figure out if it's good or bad or indifferent. First poem is called Why Black? Ah. As the elder told stories about colored people and the Negro race, the youngster said, Grandma, we ain't colored in black. Is my skin the color of coal, soot, soiled and dirty, evil and dismal, full of sorrow? What evil is there in the swagger in my walk, the music in my talk, a cultural heritage rich with distinctive qualities that celebrates life and love? Why condemn me to one color, one shade, when I am exotic, ebony, delectable, dark chocolates, mocha bronze, copper white gold, a skin that absorbs the sun's rays and emits a sweet glow? I am all of these things and more. Why relegate me to one color, one language, one look, one way, when I represent all the visible rays of the spectrum? Why black? Next poem is... Uh, my tribute to Jimmy and Janice, and it's called, When a Voodoo Child, a White Blues Mama Go Out in a Purple Haze. It was a tribal gathering of liars, lovers, wannabes, druggies, prophets, and profiteers. The ceremony of possession had begun. The frenzy of poetry and human spirituality heightened into a religious experience, conjuring musical, magical madness that expelled evil and hate. And when the syncretism occurred, we became enraptured by a guitar hero who evoked ap apocalyptic sounds and sensations while a white blues mama leapt on stage, a howling dervish jangling into a pulsating pastiche of color. They had fucked the darkness and we had tasted the night. In their brief mad existence, they lived a life of extremes, nonconformity and excess. And as they became the dearest children to the anger of death, we believed. 
we were foolish to believe in everything and anything because we believed it would last forever. We were so naive that we believed we could taste the sounds and extract the sour textures from their oxygen and inhale painted pictures of Earth and space. The human experience wailed masterful licks like an evangelist in a gospel trance, turning us upside down. He shouted predictions with divine inspirations and blue dust wielding his musical weapon in every direction, plucking the strings with his teeth, setting his guitar on fire with the solemnity of a ritual sacrifice as the guitar gods granted blessings. Something spiritual was happening. He sucked the guitar and humped the amps and we ate his orgasmic grunts. With tortured squeals and lascivious moans, his black anger clothed in Carnaby Street, hidden at crowds and collapsed boundaries, sounds of eclectic pop delved into smooth flowing psychedelic hysteria harnessing distortion and feedback. A catalepsy broke out and it grew. It spread and white hippies and black revolutionaries linked arm in arm becoming one. Living orgasm melding in the thunderous turmoil while he climbed higher, 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 higher while she, a rock and roll banshee, stomped her feet, wiggled her hips and punched her thighs in erotic fury. Her body vibrated to seismic pulses, tossing her tangled mane from side to side, offering an or after an inspirational swig of southern comfort, she grabbed the mic with a white knuckle grip, straddled it, clenched it, threatening to eat it whole, threatening to eat us whole, shaking her fists with vengeful glee, she hollered, hollered over the stage, hollered like a fish woman, wrenching it out of some deep, dark pit, a piercing, wailing, mangy, backwards, primal blue, scream, Jesus Christ. He was fucking glorious shimmering and shivering in sweat, belting out a stupendously shattering, stuttering, staggering, a cry. Honey, she won't know cheap thrill. She was a genius drunk, rock giver drunk, full of purity, full of things no one ever seen before. A free-spirited empress on a cosmic blues trip, she preached the gospel with revivalist fervor. And amidst the noise of rock and roll, we cried out our own kind of amens. No his guitar by the neck and wrestled it into a new era where fingers spurring across strings, blistering psychedelic notes rang out from banks of amplifiers and speakers. He began falling, falling from the sky he had so passionately kissed. Magical. Light years away from anything we'd ever experienced in the possession had taken hold. Taking us into a realm of no return, we could not hear the prelude to death, but we believed. We had to believe, we foolishly believed, because we were the flower power, hippie revolutionary, Woodstock, pot smoking, LSD injected motherfuckers who knew it all. And as we listened with our fists and ears flying high, we were sucked into a maelstrom, unaware of antic despair. We knew we could never fall, or could we? Even when they became cold and lifeless, their notes committed to vinyl, we remained trapped in the past. We remain floating. And thank you. How much time I got left? Um, I'm going to read two more poems. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this poem was written. This poem Gabrielle, you've gone muted again. Whoa. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, this poem was written when everybody in the literary community was fighting over the Malcolm X movie. And um, so this is called the epitaph of a poet. You smell death from around the corner. Instead of fleeing, you stood ground with the gift of the griot. Your prophecy was thrust into martyrdom for inclusion in the American pantheon. With intense single-mindedness, you rose, rose above oppression and emerged, a freedom fighter, a rebel god, a rebel god of the inner city exploding, the gospel according to the nation and with bittersweet and electrifying us with incandescent language that opened wounds and with finger-searing racial judgment, you cut down the enemy with your tongue forcing us to re-examine racial pride, the emasculation of black manhood, connecting us to the mother, motherland, betrayal never entered your mind. Brilliant and funny, you, a pent up volcano became the controversial fruit that tasted oh so sweet and when your 
ties with the nation soured and you made pilgrimage to Mecca, you struggled for truths, became our truths. You struggled not knowing how to recreate yourself on the run. And in your struggle, evolution pointed towards revolution and you, you became more powerfully potent, more dangerous, a clear threat to powerful forces, yet you continued along the path of self-discovery and in your final gesture, blasted backwards in the bedlam of gunfire. Blasted backwards, again, as you laid in your own pool of blood. Blasted backwards by the hands of black men manipulated by white men into yellow hands, you fell. And when you blasted backwards, we fell backwards too. While your imminent death hearkened the call for revolutionary, revolutionary upheaval and militant uprisings, they were never quite fulfilled. Years later, your presence still hangs palpably among us in the fevered anticipation of your cinematic second coming. Your words of an indigestible fury will be deciphered into slogans, cliches, sound bites, mirrored and conflicting interpretations that entice the new generation of dispossessed des descendants. Once again, holding a spellbound, your words and images become fashionably consumed X, Mark the spot on buttons, t-shirts, posters, baseball caps. A stinging rebuke for what you really stood for, successfully shielding the reality of your life and death. In all these years, the age of your children have billowed. We struggle. We struggle with our daily lives. We struggle with your memory. We continue to struggle, and as we look to the grave for leadership, we ask, how do we begin, Brother Malcolm? How do we truly begin? Okay, and do I have, to, <laughs> do I have time for one last poem? Yeah, absolutely, huh? absolutely. Okay. All right, this poem was written, this, I've written, you know, I'm so busy publishing everybody else's stuff. I have a lot of stuff I haven't published yet, and I, realize I'm not going to last forever, so at some point I'm going to publish some of this stuff, but this poem was written um, um, about, um, it was a book based on um, lynchings. I remember I had a real in-depth conversation with Luis Reyes Rivera about this book, um, who was one of my mentors and who I miss, you know, I think that it, it really reflects what's happening today with more black deaths. So this is called Over the Blue. When he, in blue work overalls, who rose with the sun, set with the moon, kissed her on the lips goodbye. She, who was usually red, fell a blue funk, a chill. No ordinary blue, she felt Billy Blue. That day, blue eyes, cold as steel, pointed fingers, blue fear ran through and through, and as the tide of darkness gathered, he was pursued. He, snatched under a blue moon, beaten black and blue, blacker than a blue black hue under a tree of gloom, murdered, his history entombed. In 160 degrees, the villages of the unlimited blue gathered, howled a deep dirge, blue singing with kind words. She, who was usually red, dressed in blue. Her blue bracelets glimmered when she brushed, brushed his lips with her fingers, burnished blue. And as a bevy of bluebirds flew by, she too became blue. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Baba, Oh, good. We can hear the clapping now. You can also yeah. look over in the comments. People are making comments as all of you read. Everyone had nice things to say. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. That was very powerful. And we can Thank unmute so ourselves now because I do want everyone to hear us be able to cheer and clap. Um, please give it up again for our readers. Billy Perdomo. Yay! 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 Lucian Berrios. Gabrielle Davis, thank you so much. Okay. Oh, I've got the gallery view back. I can see everybody. Cool. So I want to do a quick mingle. And if the authors want to answer questions in the order that you read, that would be cool. I'm going to start. And then, audience members, if you have a question in the chat box, just type question and 
Tracy, who also has my name, I think, in front of her um, her video. She's also she's running the, the Zoom reading right now and is the host. She will be taking the order of questions. All right, so a question to all of the authors. I also run some like writing workshops and I keep hearing this from a lot of writers right now. What do you say to new or young writers who are wondering with the state of the world today, what is the purpose of writing poetry or creative fiction? What is the purpose of literary writing? Oh, great question. Um, who wants to go first? Well, I think right now, personally, I think this is the time where everybody is finding like the artist within themselves because we're not distracted by our, our, you know, the systems that we've been conditioned to live in and which I think that's why everybody's kind of like full of anxiety that we're living against the virtual nature really. And now all of that has been removed. All these things that we relied on for our stability and what we thought was happiness, which is our jobs and our money and rushing to and from work and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And now we're kind of forced to really sit with ourselves and our probably our inner child that, that needs a bit of healing. And one of the best ways I think to do that is through art, you know? So I, I think like writing, journaling is incredibly important. It's incredibly important <laughs> process that because you, you just write whatever it is, just whatever it is, not thinking about where it's going to go, but you can look back on it and look at like what your dominant thoughts are and try to figure out how you really feel about anything. You know, which is why I think it's so important and people should start doing that now. I think this whole situation is necessary for everyone on a personal level and for like the whole world on just a spiritual and global. Thank you, I like that. You actually think it's like, it, it freezes up a little more than it did before. That's interesting. And then, Willie? Uh, the role, the role of, uh, I don't know, you know, you never want to put too much pressure on, 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 on the writing, you know, at, at any point in yeah. time, I think, but, uh, mm -hmm. now I'm interested in like the level of, uh, limitations that we have now in terms of where we go, how far we can go. Uh, and we seem to be living in the kind of restrictive, uh, regime, if you will, right? Like there's, uh, mm -hmm. there's, how are we responding to that? It seems that in that moment of a crisis, folks start to remember a lot more. They start to kind of dig into their memory a lot more. Uh, they start to remember uh, the smallest things. But I'm interested to see the poems and the plays and the songs that will be more about uh, not freedom, which is something that we're all heavily invested in, I think, as artists, but the lack of freedom. Uh -huh. how, how does that work? How is that going to make its way uh, into the writing that we see in the next, you know, five to ten years for sure? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was actually thinking about the Decameron the other day, because my first instinct in the pandemic was to, to was to go write about like things that we don't have, like laughter and like sex and touching, and that's what the Decameron did. It was like dirty, funny plays and stuff, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So who's going to keep our journals, right? At this point is in time, right? Who's going to like Lucy Ann was saying, like who's going to keep For like a year, it's going to be really important for folks to record everything and uh, and document this moment for sure. Then is Catherine still? Oh, there you are. Hi, Catherine. Well, I agree with uh, with everybody. Be more contemplative. Write it down. Right. That's what Steve would say. Write it down. <laughs> right. <laughs> Get busy and write it down. <laughs> Gabrielle? Well, um, you know, uh, you know, the argument has been for, for over a hundred years about um, you know, the be is the best, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. I think we're being, uh, again. Someone's unmuted accidentally. Oh. Um, I think that, um, you know, the argument about, you know, writing poetry during war, is that the best poem? Is that really art or is that a reaction to the times itself? And does that make it less 
better because people are rushing through it. I think that that whatever times we live in, um, that uh, journaling is good, but the quality of writing needs to always be, there's, there's no excuse to be able to write the things that you need to write and do quality writing so that people can um, react the way that you want them to react. Um, and that you should, even in the times as bad as these, times as bad as this, um, uh, people should still be cognizant of the craft. I think that, you know, one of the problems with poetry these days is that all you have to do is get a piece of paper and a, a, pen, a pencil and say, I'm a writer. You know, Christian V, I'm a writer. And there's more to writing than just writing. There's, it's reading, it's learning about the world, um, being interested in the world, and um, without saying is the thing that people who really want to be writers really need to focus on, um, regardless of what times we're living in. And then the work and the ideas will, will shine through. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I think it was David Sedaris who said, I can't teach someone to write, but I can teach them to read. And from the reading, then the writing improves. So, yeah. So I just got a text from someone, I'm not going to tell you who, but it's someone who's here who's like, I don't know if you know, you can private chat each other. I guess some of you do know that. And they were like, there's some flirting going on in this grid. So it's like a real poetry reading. <laughs> that just made my day. All right, I just want to open it up to the audience now so that we can feel like we're a little bit together. Any questions that you have for the writers? It can be to all the writers or to one of the individual authors who shared. We've got about five minutes left for questions. And unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Anybody? No questions? All right. Oh. Are we doing this every month? Yeah, um, not every month. Right now I'm trying to actually get some funding for this so we can start like paying some of the authors, um, but it's probably going to be bi-monthly. Oh, We're just setting up all of the programs um, for Tribes again and trying to get funding in and trying to get moving forward. But this is the first in the Spotlight series. I'm going to try to do it bi-monthly, so hopefully uh -huh. you'll all come back. I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully soon it can be in person. That's that would be great. Uh, I think I see you. Kimberly Brown, where'd you go? You were raising your hand? Um, it's really great to have this uh, dedicated to Steve Cannon, though. It, no matter how often you do it, hopefully more often than every other month, it would be nice to have it every month. But uh, I'm glad that you're doing it. It's, it's great to see everybody. And thank you. Thank you. Great to hear you. So as far as, by the way, as far as writing goes, I. Uh, I teach a lot of writing workshops. Uh, I wouldn't worry about what you're writing. I would just write. Um, you start in the middle, keep going, keep a pad by your bed if that makes you happy. If, if, you, if you get ideas during the night or first thing in the morning or you have a dream, write it down. Just um, basically let it roll. Totally agree. Thank you, Dorothy. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. I think I saw Kimberly Brown raising her head hand for a question. Are you still on, Kimberly? Trying to find you here. Just unmute yourself if you're still on and want to ask a question. Kimberly Lee? Anyone, if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and speak. Anybody else? Anybody? All? The next at Tribes, tell us about it, Shavisa. Well, right now we are redesigning the website and working with the web designer. The website's about four years old and it's really kind of just an ad hoc um, like Squarespace website right now. So I'm working with a web designer to redesign the website. And within the next six weeks, we're gonna have relaunched the online literary magazine. There's also going to be an online art gallery that's coming very soon, hopefully within the next three months. Um, and then we're going to be, I'm going to be doing a fiscal sponsorship portal portal on the website as well that's lower threshold than some of the other fiscal sponsorships that are available right now through NIFA or Fractured Atlas. So the individual artists who are looking for grants for yourselves can use Tribes as a fiscal sponsor if you're not incorporated. Oh. Um, and, I'm, and I just put out a new submission call that's laughing and touching. Um, that's the theme. So we're now taking submissions for political satire. It can be dark. It can be funny. It can be light. 
but it's two themes, laughing and touching. It's online literary magazine. So check on tribes.org in the submission guidelines. You can send your work right now through July 15th. And the You're awesome. And hopefully this series will, um, this, another one of these will be coming soon too. And is the fundraiser still going? Yeah, so we're trying to get funding. 50% um, of all the funding raised through the GoFundMe campaign is gonna be going directly to writers and artists. Um, Steve usually paid writers for work that was published on the website, especially if you're commissioning new work, like a new essay or review. And we wanna have like a funding pool there ready to pay writers to create and to support working writers right now, especially in this time. So if you can give, please do. If you can't, maybe you can share it. That's also very helpful. Um, and that's on Tribe's website and also on the Facebook page, Gathering of the Tribes. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oh, Catherine? Thank you, Shavisa, so much. I'm so, I'm so excited about everything that you're doing. Steve's piano is on permanent display right now at the Schomburg Center. No way! Yeah. <laughs> and the Fails <laughs> Library. Oh, yeah. So they're being archived right now. So we're, we're also... Oh mission is now not just to support artists which I don't think that's like only but we're also part of our now to memorialize Steve Cannon who's amazing because uh, we want Steve I'm to be so part of happy to hear that man I'm so happy to hear that yeah <sighs> yeah all right thank you everyone for coming and you thank can unmute yourselves you. and just make noise now Thank you. Hey, everybody. Everybody did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. I needed to hear this. It was really nice. Bye. Good. You're good. Bye. Bye. Love you madly. Thank you. Love you madly. Love you, Catherine. Love you, Catherine. Bye. Beautiful. Catherine, I haven't seen you in so many years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were one of the first people I met at Tribes. Oh, so, a joy, a joy. 99, 2000. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a joy to see you. <laughs> this is being recorded, by the way. We're going to put it up on Tribes. Yeah. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for coming. This is like a bar. We all kind of hang out and chat. <laughs> Thank you, Chavisa. Thank you. Have you got on here, Lydia? Hey, Lydia. It's so good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> All right. I'm really going to go now. Bye. 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 Bye, Chavisa. Bye. 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 Thank you, Catherine. Bye, Luciana. Bye. Bye. Everybody. Bye, Mary. <laughs> see you down there. Oh, bye. Bye, Lydia. Oh, bye, Libby. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye. Nice to see you. Oh, nice. Nice hug. to see you. I miss you. <laughs> it's hard to say goodbye. <laughs> Do it more often. <laughs> I know. Oh, we should Zoom sometime. I miss everyone. Yeah. Thank you Sorry, so much, Tracy, for all of your work. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> There's a lot of people. This is pretty hey. <laughs> How many people came? Do you know? Could you see it? Uh, yeah, there was about 30 at one point, I think. But oh, nice. somebody like Good. this iPad person came in like five times. I don't know. There was <laughs> glitches, and uh, but yeah, we'll work it out for sure. That's a big. That's a big reading for Zoom. So that's yeah, cool. it was. <laughs> it was pretty big. You liked it, Lily? <laughs> yeah, it was really great too. Okay. I felt awkward hosting virtually, but I think it worked. Oh, we can stop recording now. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the video. Yeah, stop oh, the video. That was, that was my video, not the video. <laughs>